Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. On this week's podcast, we talked with a homeowner that did the right thing, it appears. They painted their dining room and it looked great. That was several years ago. Now they have a few dings and such that they want to touch up a little bit. Well, they retrieved the same paint can. They painted everything and it looked okay, but under certain lights, they can see every place they touched up. What happened? Well, there's several things that could be happening here, and we try to guide her through several different options to, in order to really make that dining room look like it should. Yeah, that's often a problem, right, Danny? When you, you patch up the wall and you paint it, and then when it dries, you can see every little repair. And sometimes when you use old paint, you're not really saving yourself any time or money if you have to go out and buy new paint. Speaking of painting, we're going to talk to a homeowner had a question about when is it too cold to paint? Is that an actual fact that it can be too cold to paint? And that absolutely is true. And we'll talk about when you should paint regarding the weather. And boy, that blew up our website there. We got so many responses from people because you get a lot of different opinions. I tell you, you get a lot of opinions when you're talking about painting of any kind. So that'll be very interesting. Hey, also, we're going to be talking about a problem that a fat cat is causing in Baltimore, actually causing a squeaky problem. What in the world could that be? You have a, <laughs> stay tuned. It's a pretty interesting uh, little conversation we have. And I've got a simple solution. How to improve the dust collection in your shop using, of all things, a bicycle inner tube. Okay, there's a lot of things to consider here and a lot of things that we're going to share with you. So let's get started. Right now, uh, Joe, every week we have some painting questions. We have Wilma on the phone right now. Wilma, I understand that uh, you sound a little frustrated with this email that we have here. Tell us about your painting issue, and, and certainly welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a painting issue. Uh, we, we recently decided to do a few paint touch-ups in a room that we painted um, by a couple, two, maybe maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. So my husband caulked the few scratches and holes and nicks and things that you know had occurred, and it was I think it was just regular white paintable caulk. Okay. And I went out into the garage and found the original paint can. We still had a little bit in the in the paint can, and anyway, we uh, we carefully painted over the repairs. And now several weeks later, when the lights on or are on in that room, I can clearly see every one of those areas that was repaired and repainted. What did we do wrong? Oh, boy. You asked your husband to paint the room. That was the first problem. <laughs> you should have done it yourself, Wilma. <laughs> Well, I, I tell you, you know, there, it, it is a challenge on that because you would certainly think, okay, you did the right thing by saving the paint can. You know, a lot of times people will discard those, and so you save the paint can. Uh, was it stored in a moderate climate, or, or was it in an outside garage where it could have been, get, where it could have gotten too hot or too cold? Oh yeah, it was. It was blazing hot. <laughs> okay. Okay. It, it was. It was not. It was not climate control. Yeah, it was, it, was out of control. <laughs> okay, all right. Climate out of control. Yeah, I think I have one of those spaces at my house too. Well, you know, a lot of times in those kind of environments, um, you know, paint is really pretty tough, but still, it's fragile enough that separation can occur when it gets too hot or too cold. And even though you mix and mix and mix it, which I assume that you did, a lot of times oh, yeah. you'll have that. But Joe, you also have that situation where the existing paint on the wall is going through some changes. Yeah, right. Well, I was thinking the same thing. Even though the paint might only be two years old, um, you know, no matter how much you mix it, it might not be exactly the same color because the old <laughs> paint or the paint that's on the wall may have changed. But the biggest problem with often with trying to blend in an area that's been repaired is that most people, you know, if the, if the repair is two inches around, let's say they paint an area that's four or five inches around, you actually have to paint a much bigger space area. So you have mm. to paint almost like a, a much larger section, maybe even half the wall or a four foot square, even though the patch might only be two or three inches in diameter, because you mm. want okay. it to blend in. Now, um, and, and this is this doesn't pertain to you, but the other, if you're buying new paint to match, even if you buy the same exact 
recipe, you know, the same color mix and the same manufacturer and everything else. Sometimes it doesn't quite match, and especially if you don't buy the same sheen. So if you're buying new paint, <coughs> excuse me, new mm -hmm. paint, be sure to get the same sheen, whether it's if the old paint's yeah. flat, you got to make sure you use flat. So I suspect if you, um, you know, if, if, it, if it's pretty obvious, I would just get a new can of that paint and paint the whole wall. That's yeah. about the okay. only sure way. I mean, you could try just painting a much larger area and see if that works. If not, then you can paint the whole wall because that's often mm -hmm. the only thing you can do, especially if there are more than, let's say, two or three repairs on the same wall. Yeah, and, and there are. There were there were some nicks and, you know, gouges and things like that. Right. And, and the good news, it would okay. be just one light coat of paint is right. all that would yep. be needed in order to make it look brand new. Okay. All right. That seems to answer my question. Put it on your husband's <laughs> list and you sit back and just relax. Uh, it's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so, thanks so much for being with us here on Today's Homeowner. Thank you. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, that as frustrating as it can be when you try to right. go back. You know, we're uh, again about to sell our house, and I saw some nicks and dings here. Got got the paint, and uh, you know, it's been stored in a good place and so forth. And uh, uh, but you, but boy, if you if you if you don't, you know, first of all, you got to put two coats on it, and then you know, you tend to put put the coats on too thick. Uh, right. And that causes a problem. But uh, also, a lot of people are not aware of the trim roller, what I call a cigar roller. Right. Um, yep. is pretty cool to blend in a lot of paint like that because you can, you know, cover the area, but then you can kind of spread it out a little bit more to help it blend in a little bit. Yeah, a trim roller is simply a paint roller that's usually only about an inch in diameter, three-quarter inch in diameter, maybe four to six inches long. And it's for painting trim, which is why they call it a trim roller. And um, they're pretty affordable, and, you know, it's great for doing smaller areas but again i would paint first paint a much larger area and if necessary paint the whole wall and by the way if you buy new paint and it doesn't match exactly if you paint one whole wall you won't really notice it if it's not if it's just that's a, right sure uh -huh. you know like a very very small degree off the color of the old wall because walls that per that are perpendicular to each other perpendicular to each other reflect light differently so mm -hmm. they might look different anyway that's exactly right. Hey, I wanted to uh, play something here. We got a, again, we're getting just great uh, feedback from people um, on uh, the Today's Homeowner Hotline. And uh, here's a question that came in I, I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, this is Jim from Oregon. There is a beetle that will ca crawl between the inside of the insulation and crawl on the uh, PEX pipe. When they want water, they'll bore a little, little microscopic hole and it'll start dripping. And eventually, It'll cause a leak, and I know a guy that did it, and uh, he did it up in the attic, and the whole hallway, after you know a year or two, or the whole ceiling of the hallway fell down mm. because it got all damp and wet and icky. But uh, they found out what it was, is this little beetle. There is a name for it, can't tell you what it is. Uh, they went by it too fast when I was talking to them. Huh. Huh, well, I'm sure that might scare a few folks if they have PEX piping. I've uh, never heard of this. I turn to my buddy Joe, who is a professional journalist, and he will just turn over every rock and every uh, beetle to find out exactly <laughs> what the problem is. Uh, uh, Joe, I've never heard of anything like this. And uh, what, what did you find out? Yeah, I, I talked to all my beetle friends. And uh, actually, a, a little bit of trivia on top of trivia. You know, I think I read this one time when I was a kid studying science in school that beetles are the most populous creature on the planet. Like there are really? more beetles than humans, than fish, than reptiles. Beetles are going to someday take over the world. Wow. That's okay with me. Wow, that's scary. we got a sc scary show going here. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's uh, especially this caller, uh, Jim, said he's from Oregon, and because of that, I think I know the answer. There's a beetle called the Western Conifer Seed Bug. Hmm. And it's called that because first it, it's from the west, um, has since migrated. It was west of the Rockies. It has since started to migrate east. Um, in fact, we've found some of them here in New England. But um, they feed on the sap of, of pine cones, essentially. And why they're drilling holes in pecs, we're not really sure. And pecs, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's just plastic piping. A lot of homes are now, the water lines are not copper, which would be great if you live out in Oregon because the, cop, the beetles won't be able to drill through the copper. But they are attracted. Maybe there's a little bit of condensation on the outside of these pipes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody knows exactly why mm -hmm. the beetles are attracted to it um, once they get in the house. And just like they drill a hole into the pine cones to get the sap, they drill holes into the... Pex piping, and it's a little teeny tiny hole, but, you know, 
it's got water under pressure, so it doesn't have to be much of a hole for water to start leaking out. So that's what it is. So, okay, so the next question is, all right, so I've got beetles in my house. Now what? That I'm not sure. I mean, I would obviously need to call an exterminator in your area, and if they've seen this problem, they might have a solution for it. Yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> Crazy, right? It's always something. Well, there's so many, uh, you know, pests that you deal with and so many things. Uh, another thing in, in many, many areas of the country, maybe not so much during the winter months, but during the summer months, the fire ant can be very, very bad. Lots of different types of ants. But so trivia, Joe. Okay. Where where was the fire ant introduced into the United States? What port? Was I'm guessing in- since you live in Mobile, it would be the Port of Mobile. If there's such well, a place, that's uh, that's true. Darn it! See, ah. you're too you're too good at trivia. I don't I don't like playing trivia with you. Um, <laughs> that was just a wild guess. Yes, it. Uh, they traced it back to a boat um, coming in. Uh, I think from South America um, right. into the Port of Mobile and uh, unloading, and it. You know, had it, you know, it, it had, uh, it had, you know, and his family had, uh, you know, Freddie, <laughs> Freddie the ant had uh, gotten, gotten off with his family, and then they started a colony, and then they've spread all across the country. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how often that happens with, you know, fruit coming in from all over and lumber, and you know, and once it gets started, that's it. Right. There's almost no going back. Almost well, no we've heard back. of all kinds of things. I mean, silver, silverfish, and all kinds of bugs and roaches, and everything, all kinds of things like that. But just a few tips here, and you've heard all of these, but just a reminder on some of the ways to keep some of these pests um, out of your house, especially during this winter. First of all, put up a barrier, seal every crack you possibly can. Check out those thresholds under the doors. Check out any gap that you may have anywhere around the house. Just take a real slow, calculated walk around your your house and just see any place at all that you can seal up with foam or caulk or additional um, insulation. And uh, also, um, Joe, of course, you know, most of the problems with these guys, they're always looking for food. Always looking for food. And if uh, you live in an area where, you know, either you have termites or you have just bugs in general, you want to seal up any kind of food. You want to seal out water. You don't want to stack up firewood anywhere near your house. I mean, it could be near your house, but not up against your house. But, yeah, they have airtight containers specifically designed for storing food in them. And especially if you're traveling a lot or it's a house that, you know, maybe it's like a summer home or a winter home or something like that, you, know, you just can't leave food out because that, that, that's like ringing a dinner bell and, bell and not only little bugs, but also uh, rodents are going are gonna to come in there. Certainly, and, and and also it goes without saying, the cleaner the house, the fewer problems sure. you're going to have with pests. So, you know, even if it doesn't look like you need to vacuum, vacuuming is always a, a great way to go. And we certainly recommend using a central vac system that instead of recirculating the air and potential dust and so and contaminants uh, inside the house, it actually moves that all of that straight to the outside. So uh, always better to have a central vac system. Some people love them. Uh, um, some people don't understand the benefits of it and would rather have something that they just push around, but it's always better quality-wise to have that. Hey, let's shift gears a little bit. It's uh, time for our Best New Product segment brought to you by The Home Depot, how doers get more done. Hey, believe it or not, one of the best solutions to a to clean a bathroom mirror is actually a product in the automotive department. A bottle of Turtle Wax Dash and Glass Cleaner naturally cleans mirrors. Considering how well it works to create a crystal clear car windshield, it just makes sense. Turtle Wax Clearview technology makes glass streak-free and surfaces dust-free. You can find out more about Turtle Wax Dash and uh, Glass Cleaner by logging on to homedepot.com. You know, that reminds me um, That's kind of interesting. That that reminds me, Joe, about a, a tip we were talking about years ago about um, that you can actually use a car wax right. and put a very, very light coat on the walls of your shower, and that will prevent soap scum from building up. It'll just make it easier to keep clean. So, you know, you think about the how it repels water and kind of right. beads water up on cars. Makes sense on the hard surfaces you have in your shower. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, if it if it allows water to run off your car more easily, I guess it would on tile as well, or acrylic or something like that. And on glass surfaces in the shower, I think we recommended using um, like windshield sealer or whatever uh, they call Rain-X. it. Rain-X. Rain-X, right, yeah. right. Wind, uh, now, windshield treatment, because that yeah. allows the water to really sheet right off. 
Yeah, we mentioned that um, a, a couple years ago here on the radio show as well as our television show. And boy, we got a lot of people that wrote us back and saying, you're right. Why did not think of that? <laughs> and they applied. And it just, you know, it just makes sense. It just allows that water and the soaps come and everything to peel off a lot, uh, a lot better. So a lot of different ways that you can have a house, keep a house clean without spending all your time working on it. I'll tell you what, it is just, I just get a kick out of conversation that starts up online. And, you know, you, you see a lot of uh, good, healthy opinions being shared in different formats online. And I'll cert- I can certainly encourage you to check it out at todayshomeowner.com because we have various articles that are trending all the time. Here's one that's trending on todayshomeowner.com is recommended temperatures for painting. And we got into quite a controversy here in a way. Let me just read you just a, a, an excerpt of the actual article. The maximum and minimum recommended temperatures for exterior your paint varies depending on the type of paint, oil or latex, and specific brands of paint used. But a general rule of thumb is that oil-based paint can be applied when the temperatures are between 40 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit and latex between 50 and 85. The best drying will occur when the relative humidity is 40 to 70 percent. Too high or too low temperature can cause the paint to not bind together properly, which can lead to cracking and peeling. Latex can also be difficult to apply at high temperatures since it may dry too quickly to brush it out properly. When you're painting outside, work your way around the house during the day so that you're not painting in the sun, since the actual temperature on a sunny surface will be much higher than the weather forecast in the shade temperature. So that's a good, straightforward information. This this is factual. This is, we know this is the way that you should consider the guidelines. But we got um got one here from Bertie. Bertie uh, commented, my contractor plans on painting my house this week. I live in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Highs this week will be in the low 40s and lows will be in the 20s. He assures me that it is okay and he's been doing it for years. I'm nervous. Uh, Joe, um, I think Bertie should be a little nervous and should be a little reluctant to be working with a contractor that goes completely against the rules. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Because not only is 20s too low, but when the, the, those temperatures need to be maintained for a 24 hour period. So if it says you're not supposed to apply paint below 40 degrees, it's not just when you apply the paint, but it's for 24 hours after you apply the paint. So if it's 40 degrees or 50 degrees when he when he brushes on the paint, and then it goes to 20. That's not good. The paint might not fail. Might not fail. Might fail. Might not bond properly. So yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. You know, first of all, if you're nervous when talking to a contractor, recognize that there might be a reason why you're feeling nervous, and you know take a step back and talk to somebody else. Hey, another comment on that same article came in from Tom. It says, listen, people, if your painter says something like, it's okay, I've been painting for 20 years, and if he has painted the same house more than two times, then he's not your guy. Go online and read the temperature recommended by the manufacturer of the paint. Don't listen to your painter if he wants to paint below 50 degrees ambient temperature. Most pros like to repaint your home every 5 to 12 years. Prep, of course, is is the most important and application should not be rushed. We only paint between mid-June to September weather permitting nothing below 50 degrees nighttime temperature. 24-hour times are very very important as Joe has mentioned in the in the bonding of it. Here's another one from Elbert says does the storing of latex or oil-based paint in temperatures less than or greater than those mentioned for application affect the paint properties and uh, uh, Joe, we've talked about this many times that, you know, you you take that paint, you, you've painted the room, the place looks beautiful, you got a half a gallon left right. over, you just take it, you put it out in your shed, and you think, well, I may or may not ever use it. Well, you, you probably shouldn't use it if it ever gets down to where it's freezing, right. or if they, it happens to get, um, you know, well above 90 degrees or 100 degrees in that, uh, that's going to really affect the makeup of that paint, whether it's oil or latex. Right. Certainly the freezing will, and and especially with latex paint, of course, because it has water in it. So, yeah, you definitely want to keep it from freezing. And, you know, so it means storing it in a basement or crawl space. You know, if you have a garage that's insulated and heated, some parts of the north they have heated garages. Um, But, yeah, it's it's easy to just put it out in the back shed. Mm -hmm. But if it freezes, then, you know, you'll see when you go to use it next time, the paint won't act 
the way it should. So you'd have to toss it out and get new paint. It can get strange. It can, uh, you know, be a different color. It can just not dry. So you yeah, it doesn't to, mix you know. as well. The, the pigments and the uh, and the the late the, the water basically it doesn't doesn't mix as well. Hey, let's get back to the phones right now. We're going to head to Baltimore. John's on the line with a uh, common problem this time of the year. John must be getting caught going down to the refrigerator for the peanut butter and jelly sandwich because he's got squeaky floors. Tell us all about it, John, and welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Um, Well, 40 years ago, I bought this house and uh, in August, and toward the fall, all of a sudden, the floors started really squeaking. Now, I've, I asked a neighbor of mine about that, and he said, what kind of floors do you have? And I said, well, it, probably Georgia pine. He said, well, you know what we do with Georgia pine? Now, he's a construction foreman, and he knows what he's doing. And I said, okay, what? He said, let him squeak. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the answer you wanted. <laughs> no, it wasn't. So I decided to get a second opinion because uh, lately my cat has been making the floors squeak so oh, I'd, I'd appreciate some help <laughs> sounds well, like your cat needs to be on a diet that's what it sounds like to me well uh, yeah that that too <laughs> well you know what happens so much though of course it's all about the friction the wood is moving and probably because of the um drier conditions you know with your heat system on and that this time of the year and everything the relative humidity in the house dropping down and that's causing shrinkage in all of the boards that's allowing it to have have a little more movement and causing that. A lot of times, um, nothing can be done. I mean, we we do um, we have recommended a number of times, and it's worked very well to actually put um, baby powder or talcum powder in some of the worst areas and rub it in there. And that's basically just a temporary fix that will just kind of um, cushion that uh, squeakiness and so forth. But um, almost works like a lubricant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like not, a dry, but that's like, how it like, works. Like graphite right? almost. But do you exactly. have access uh, to the underside of any of these squeaky floors? Um, no. Well, half of them I do. My house is built uh, with part of the house on, on a cr- under, over a crawl space right. and rest is a small basement. Yeah. So I can get to some parts of it, but yeah. not all. Because a lot of times, I mean, uh, if you have a, 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 a lot of times if you go under the crawl space area and you use a, a, a screw that would be, let's see, Joe, if we've got three-quarter inch um, subfloor, we've got right. three-quarter inch floor, so you wouldn't want to exceed, let's inch see, an inch and a quarter. Right. That way you're going through your subfloor and then securing the floor above it without the, the, the screw um, showing up on the surface side. Now, that's a lot of work, and if it's only a portion <laughs> of the house, it you know it may or may not be successful in solving all of the squeaks, but it could solve some. But Joe, also, you know, I hear a lot of people using the little trim screw that's that uh, the right. small yeah. diameter, small head, and just attacking it from up top with the proper color putty. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the other option, John. But if you, if you do have access from below, the other thing that that works is if you have someone walking around, maybe your cat, but you have somebody walking back and forth on the floor and you're down below so you can identify exactly where the squeak is, right? So someone would step on a place that's squeaky and they'll keep stepping on that same spot so you can find it. And sometimes it's because there's a little bit of space between the top of the joist and the underside of the subfloor. So if you take a wood shim, a really thin wood shim, put a little glue on it and just tap it in there. And when I say tap it in there, I mean just tap it in very lightly. If you drive it all the way in there, you're going to raise the floor and create a bigger space. What you're trying to do is just fill that space. And then the floor or the subfloor won't move up and down because the shim will be in there. And that will prevent, often will prevent the squeaking. So you could try that. Um, But if you you want to attack it from the top, you can use trim head screws and drive them down. It's best to drive them into a joist. But, of course, the squeaks aren't always where the joist is. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Well, it's better than just saying, let them squeak, I guess. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll try that. I like that idea. Okay, the other, John. John, the, the one other, excuse me, Dan, I was going to say, John, the, one other thing, I've not done this, but I've heard people have done it with floors that are really squeaky in long areas. They take a 
an ang- angle iron, like a 90 degree long angle iron, maybe it's an inch or inch and a half square, you know, on each leg. And they just uh-huh. put it up against the joist and they screw it to the very top of the joist so that the other flange is up against the subfloor. You just run a bunch of screws up there. And, you know, so uh-huh. you're just basically tying it down, using it as a bracket sort of. So you could try that oh, as well. Yeah. But I would first try the glued shims. Okay. That, that'll work for me, I hope. All right, John, we've got, you've got a weekend coming up, so we will assume by Sunday evening when you lay your little head on your little pillow that all squeaks have been solved. So go to Thank work. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have great confidence in the advice you gave me. Good, 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 good. good. Well, thanks so much for being with us, John, and uh, have a great weekend. You too. Thank you very much, All right, guys. All right, our pleasure. Well, you know it's a new year. 2020 is here, and uh, on your resolution list, or maybe your look forward into this new year, maybe you say what a lot of people are saying is, I just want life to be a little more simple. Well, we're, we're here to help you with that way of thinking with Joe's Simple Solution. Keep it simple, Joe. Let's go. Okay, I'll, I'll try, Danny. Okay, yeah. okay here's... Here's a simple solution for using your power miter saw. It's one of the most popular benchtop tools ever invented, I think. And if you have a workshop, you're doing any kind of work, whether it's woodworking or carpentry, you absolutely have to have a power miter saw. But they do create, they blast off a lot of sawdust. And most of them have a port where you can hook up a uh, shop vac. But the hoses on the shop vacs and the hoses on the, and the port on the back of the saws don't always align properly, and there are special adapters you have to buy to make them fit together. Well, if you don't have one of those adapters, what do you do? Well, here's the solution. Get a, a bicycle inner tube. I've used old bicycle inner tubes, but there's no reason you can't use a new one. You cut a section about four to six inches long, and you stretch it out. If it's cold, it won't stretch, so I'd recommend warming it up. You know, put it in your pocket and walk around the house a few times. But anyway, once it's warm, it'll stretch really easily. And you basically are just stretching it over the end of the vacuum hose. And then you take the other end of the little rubber sleeve and stretch it over on the port on the back of the saw. That's all you need to do. It's flexible, so it can bend a little bit, so it's not going to pop off very easily. And if you clean off the dust really well, that'll really stick on there. I've, I've had it on my saw for you know, I've used it for weeks at a time, and it's never slipped off. So there you go. Try that trick, and you'll be able to collect nearly all that dust coming out the back of the saw. I'm going I'm to remember that. With my, um, I'm starting to finish out my workshop down at my oh, new house go. now, and uh, and and trying. You know, I want to hang a lot of memorabilia and so forth up on one of the walls, but I don't want to have this dust going all over the place. So uh, I have an exhaust fan in there to help uh, move some of the dust, but I'm also looking at the this type of system to put my central not my central vac but my shop vac over in the corner and have the hose that comes up on the back side of my work workbench to go into all of the tools that i have there so oh, um, i'm kind of studying some of these uh, dust collection devices that are available in systems and uh yeah. some of them some of the uh, systems for professional woodworking shops uh <clears throat> they're pretty proud of those it's uh yeah, like they're pretty uh, buying a uh, brand new buick so yeah they're uh, like two cycle right you know, cause exactly. all the light dust goes out well don't forget in the, in the heavier dust falls chips fall to the bottom don't forget that simple solution i shared a while ago danny where you take an extra wand and floor nozzle and you screw it to the wall vertically uh-huh and this way, when you're sweeping up the shop, because right. you're not always going to vacuum this shop, That's right. you just sweep it right up to that floor nozzle, and you hook mm-hmm. that up to the, the shop vac. And so uh-huh. it's basically like an automatic vacuum a- system. Actually, right I found some extra wands and some extra things back in the tool oh, room that I have uh, set aside for, for that type of thing, the inevitable to do that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try right. that because I think it would be too much to put one of the little uh, Roombas uh, automatic vacuums in there. I think it would just be a little a little too much. But You'd have 10 Roombas just running around <laughs> like cockroaches. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This one comes from Mary Jane from California. Our house is on the top of a steep slope where the gophers wreak havoc. But after 29 years of living here, they are coming up between the cement driveway and the asphalt street. There's no space to put any type of trap, and we're very frustrated with this constant battle. Please help. Thank you very much. Boy, the... The go, the, Those are it, some pretty aggressive gophers. Boy, it takes you right back to Caddyshack, doesn't it? You know, with uh, <laughs> all the things Bill Murray tried there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. What What do you think she could do, Joe? I mean, what what can you do? I mean, you don't necessarily want to kill them, but how do you repel them and make them move to somebody else's house? 
Gophers, yeah. Well, we had talked a couple of times on the radio show about using mothballs uh-huh. to get rid of skunks and raccoons. And I would certainly try that, but I'm, I'm not sure I understand why there's no space to put a trap. I mean, mm-hmm. these traps are relatively small. That's why gophers are relatively small. I can't imagine there's not a place to put a trap. You can rent you can rent or buy a have a heart trap. I'm not sure what gophers eat, but I assume they eat vegetables or fruit or whatever. So I'd try trapping them. But yeah, gophers can cause a lot of damage because they start tunneling and they don't tunnel just one tunnel either. They can branch out. Man. And these guys are coming up between concrete and asphalt. I know it. Those are some tough gophers here. Maybe they have little picks and hammers. Or I'm not sure how they even do that. Yeah. Yeah, I would certainly try that because it doesn't take much to detour them and make them go to someplace else. Maybe they can find some softer digging there somewhere, but uh, they can create a lot of problems there. So hopefully that'll uh, help you there, Mary Jane. And if you would like to send us a question, please do so. Todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. You can find out all about the background of the podcast, where you can download it, and you can pretty much download this podcast anywhere you download your other podcasts podcast and also always like to mention we appreciate all those great reviews we're getting uh it's just a really touching some of the reviews and some of the comments that we're getting online we appreciate each and every one of those that pretty much wraps up the podcast for this week i'm danny lipford along with joe truini join us again next week